everybody knows who's watching this, Matt Cutts. I'm really super excited to meet with Matt Cutts because I haven't spoken to him in a while. Um, and he's a true friend to the industry. And it's been a while. I'm gonna hopefully ask him a lot of fun questions, stuff, stuff that maybe you've all been wondering over the course of the years and we'll see what happens. In any event, I got about a two hour ride to Philly and then another two hours from there to the DC area. So we'll see how that goes. Plus, super excited because I got this new stand and holder for my camera here. And I'm looking forward to uh, using this holder so I don't, have to, I don't have to hold on to anything. I just hold on to the steering wheel, pay attention to where I'm going, focus on that, and it will just track me as I go. And it flips around all by itself. It's like an $8 holder on, on Amazon, which is great. This could come in handy for a lot of different trips that I'm doing. So looking forward to testing this out and I hope you enjoy it. Still got about another hour and 50 um, until I get to Philly and then another two hours from there until I get to DC. Um, why don't I fly? I don't know, I like driving. I could talk to you guys more while I drive. It's less awkward for me because I'm by myself. I'm talking to a camera. Um, but in general, I also like to drive. For me to take the train, which is a great train, um, to DC would be a three hour train, but an additional 45 minutes an hour to get to the train. Plus each way, I think is like as much as a flight or more than a flight, to be honest. And this also gives me the ability to stop off in different places. I tweeted about going to DC if anybody wants me to stop off and you know, hit a vlog with them, that'd be cool. I already got one person who's coming to the hotel uh, Tuesday morning before the interview Matt um, to speak with them about what they do in the SEO, SEM world. So hopefully I'll have a bunch more as I drive saying, hey, do you mind either coming to the hotel or I stop off on the way there or the way here. Um, so it gives me the opportunity to make more stops, take more breaks and hopefully chat with more SEOs or SEMs on the way. Anyway, got some time to go. Speak to you as I head out, as I hit different states. I'll keep you posted and I hope you enjoy these vlogs. Now in another state, I'm in Delaware. Um, I still have about two hours to go from here until I hit my hotel in DC. But I just made it into Delaware and wanted to give you guys an update on that. Very, very, very exciting. You feel it? Do you feel the excitement? Anyway, stay tuned. All right, so I just made it into Washington, DC, the District of Columbia. And I think I'm about 15 minutes away from the hotel. Progress. Should be there around uh, 9.05 p.m. Which is pretty good timing, I guess. <laughs> it took a little longer than I expected. Looking forward to tomorrow. But I think it's going to be a good one. All right, so I'm here in the hotel. Long trip, but should be worth it. The view, not much of a view, but the room works. I'm sure the internet works. Everything will be perfectly fine for working tonight and working tomorrow morning. I do have a meeting in the hotel first thing in the morning and then uh, off to see Matt Cuts. Here's the view. driving over towards the White House now to meet with Matt Cutts. Looking forward to this meeting more than most, so it should be fun. All right, so I'm walking to the meeting spot where I'm meeting one of Matt's colleagues um, in order to get into his office. A lot of security. I bet they didn't know I was stalking him for the past uh, probably 15 plus years. Um, in any event, almost there. The White House, I think, is behind me. Lots of government offices around here. Pretty historic place. Right here is the Dwight Eisenhower Executive Office Building. I think the White House is like straight behind it, to the left. So they let me into the White House. This is not the White House, but close enough to it. Matt Cuts should be here in a few minutes, hopefully. It's a pretty cool space. This is one of the war rooms, I believe. Yeah, war rooms. 
<laughs> and it's just so much history in this, in this building, in this room. They won't let me record outside of this room, so I apologize. Um, but maybe on the way out, I'll record them. If they kick me out, they kick me out anyway, so no big deal. Looking forward to interviewing Matt. It's been a long time. I think it's been a couple years since I saw him. I saw him at XMX Advanced in Seattle, I think about two years ago. Um, and now it's going to be, before that, it was, it was probably a few years also. So looking forward to catching up with him, talking about some things back in his old days at Google, and then talking about what he's doing now. Hope you enjoy the interview. Speak to you soon. One, two, three. <laughs> Testing. Big empty room. Usually I do it in noisy places. Yeah, this is not too bad. Good. Although we get a little bit of reverb off of the crazy wallpaper that's actually like carved. <laughs> Matt, thanks for having me in your home. You <laughs> sleep in this room, right? Uh, so this is the Secretary of War Suite in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building on the White House Complex. And so nowhere safer to sleep. So it's pretty safe. So yeah. thanks for coming to the White House. To <laughs> do a little talking. I'm surprised to let me in, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. It's been absolutely. so long since it's been. I think the last time I saw you was at XMX Advanced. Yes. In Seattle. Yes. That's right. Probably about two years ago. It's maybe good longer. to see you again. It's good to see you too. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm surprised to let me in because I've been stalking you for about 16 years or so. <laughs> um, and it's just amazing what you've done over your career. Um, so let's talk a little about that, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, you, well, I've been wanting to interview you for the past few years or so. Mm. You left Google unofficially in 2014, mm -hmm. and then officially in 2016, I believe. 2016, yeah. So let's go back even before that. Let's talk, let's talk about your childhood. Okay. Um, you were born on what date and what's your social security number? <laughs> when I walked in here, they asked me my social security number, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. They're, the Secret <laughs> Service is very, you know, yeah. serious about that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, uh, it was interesting. I grew up in Kentucky, uh, you know, ha had a great time, uh, eastern Kentucky, so like running around the mountains and, you know, hiking on trails and stuff like that. Dad was a physics professor. And mom was an evangelical Christian, and so got an interesting combination of different points of view and a good respect for different points of view. And you have a big family, or you just got one older brother. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer and an electrical engineer. He's, okay. he's at Lexmark right now, so they make the laser printers. And cool. That's funny because my father, for years and years, he's a chemical engineer. He worked at Pitney Bowes making ink huh? until he was pushed by my mother to work in. Um, more of the corporate space to make more money. But you know, my grandfather was a printer. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Have, it's, so. it's like we have some type of family history. <laughs> yes, it's, it's like before there were computers, we had typewriters and yes. all this kind of stuff. Do you still have a typewriter? I don't. Yeah. Mm. It's funny, these, these props, they'll put in these videos, these cool vlogs, they'll put in typewriters just yeah. to make it look like it's cool. Yeah, yeah. But in any event, I don't know if you remember, I once said I kind, you kind of reminded me of my older brother. Really? You know that? I don't know if you I wrote a blog post about that years ago. You actually commented on it um, ah. on my personal blog. Um, I'm not sure why I said that. <laughs> well, maybe in a good I way. Not like not like you, the profile. not that I felt you beat up on me or anything away, <laughs> but it was more of a good thing. So, all right. So you grew up in Kentucky, um, and you obviously went to school there. Yeah. Young. Yeah. Old. University of Kentucky, Kentucky. Go Wildcats. Cool. And, and you then, studied what? Uh, well, I got a degree in computer science and mathematics because it was super easy to just take a few extra courses and get a math degree too. Okay. Um, but you did, didn't you do graphic design at first? Well, I went to UNC Chapel Hill where it was like computer graphics and virtual reality and they had this cool thing called a highball to track for, for virtual reality and inertial tracking and accelerometers. This was the 90s, right? So well. virtual reality markup language. And then at some point I realized I could, didn't have to do that work, someone else would do that work. Cool. So you, when you graduated, I guess, university, what was your first job that you could talk about? So the first job I ever had was working for what they called the Department of Defense at Fort Meade, uh, which is the National Security Agency. Oh, I drove past there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go on the campus unless you're allowed. Because there was a they, cop car. That I tried. They stopped. They take it very seriously. And I mentioned your name. They said no. Yeah, no. It's, you, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> unless you want to visit the, the National Cryptological Museum, <laughs> which you are allowed to go and visit. It's like one little corner uh, of that whole campus. But uh, yeah, so actually in the 90s, when I was a college student, did what they call co-op tour. So go to school for a semester and then work 
for a semester and alternated like four or five times. And you can't talk about what you worked there because they would really prefer you not to. <laughs> so it's always a secret. Yeah. There was a lot of rumors about. I remember like whenever like there was an update, and Google, like Google would do something like, "Oh, Matt Cotts, he worked at the NSA, no, so he no, must have been no. whatever." Again, college student <laughs> intern. Yeah, right. don't always get a lot of good stuff done when you're a college student. So intern. how long, you were there for? How long again? So four semesters of working. Up okay. There. Okay, and then at, what was your first, I guess, real job, if you want to call it real? Google. Google. Because I went UK, you a degree. grad school at UNC Chapel Hill, got my master's on the way to the PhD, never finished the PhD. Left the PhD program, much to my father's dismay. He's still upset about it. He still is. He's like, you could go back and get your PhD. You can. You should do that. I, it's, well, I probably won't happen, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a possibility. Uh, but left, left that to go uh, work on that crazy Google thing that in crazy like Google 2000. Thing. That must have been fun those days. It was fun right up until the dot-com crash hit, which was like March of 2000. And then it got pretty serious and you're like, whoa, maybe I've made bad life choices. How did, that, how did that work? How did they recruit you from, you know, did you apply to Google? <laughs> they did. did. Jobs at Google.com. Yeah, what happened is I was working on my PhD topic. I was not that happy. I was switching to a different PhD topic. And so in the middle, I'd actually taken a couple classes that were non-computer science classes. And they were like information on library science. So it was like build a search engine. And Google had just come out. It was 1999. They had like 50 people. And it was much better than like Hotbot when I was doing my grad school research. So I actually wrote them and I was like, how much do you all pay? So I, they didn't recruit me. I, I walked right through the front door. Uh -huh. well, that's awesome. And you re relocated from that for that. That was the yeah. first time you, I guess, left your family? Yeah, I mean, I'd been East Coast until then. And so uh, actually eloped, got married, took a honeymoon, and drove across the country all in January of 2000. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so now you're at Google. Um, what was one of the first things that you worked on there? Oh man, other than like regular expression, string rewriter classes, uh, the main thing that I worked on first was Safe Search. So they came and said, you know, we need a version of Google that's family safe. I said, okay, I can work on that. And so basically did some really simplistic, this was pre-machine learning, deep artificial intelligence, deep learning kind of stuff. So did something that was OK. Um, the Safe Search team uh, has since gotten a lot better, yeah. uh, you know, once they got rid of me. And so yeah, it's, sure. it's, you know, it's in different languages and all sorts of different stuff. But Safe Search was the main one. I uh, worked in the ads group for about a well, year. Let's go back to the Safe Search thing. So okay. you, obviously, the people watching this are mostly SEOs. How, like, what do you look, what do you like, what type of algorithms do you write in order to, like, detect was it mostly textual? Yeah. I mean, back then, so this is, again, super simplistic. This was like one client wanted a thing in three months kind right. of deal. So it was pretty much like learn some word weights based on a corpus of you know pornographic searches and a corpus of safe words. And so it's you know pretty trivial stuff. I remember trying to roll it out. And uh, Marissa Meyer and Paul Bukai, names you're probably familiar with, were like, it's not good enough yet. I, we want to see better, you know, like recall and not as many false positives, and so iterated a little bit more, uh, and it launched in like May, June of 2000, I think. It's amazing. And it, look, it didn't even look at the photos; so it was all textual. Just, it was all textual at that point. They do better, much better now. Well, like, yeah, I would hope so. I mean, they could literally, you could say, find me pictures of my dog in yeah, wherever, and it's yeah. like, it's pretty amazing what can, what you could do these days. Mm -hmm. All right, what else? so then after Safe Search, what was it? you worked in ads? I worked in ads for a year. You didn't seem to like that, uh, from I, what I've watched interview-wise <laughs> before. So it, there were five people in ads at the time. And what happened is I went on the ski trip when I joined, like one weekend. I was on a ski lift with a manager, and the manager was like, you'd like doing front-end programming? And I was like, sure. And she was like, OK, you're in the ads group now. I'm surprised you didn't jump at that point. No, well, it was very high. <laughs> no, I, I, I was fresh out of grad school. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I was like, OK, sure, I'll try this. Um, and like, great work. Got to work with really fantastic people. But you know, carrying the pager, so if this one machine, it was called F41, went down, then Google wouldn't make any money. Like, it was all on one machine at the yeah. time. And so, like, all of that stuff, like working on geolocation, it was a bunch of fun stuff. But I was glad to get back just in time to help start the quality group. 
And then, so that was the next thing, was quality. Yeah, yeah, so there was a guy named Wayne Rosing, and I was like, hey, I really feel like we need to concentrate on the quality of Google search, and so there was like eight people around a ping pong table, people like Jeff Dean and Sanjay. And what made you feel that, that reason to actually work on quality? So as part of working on safe search, I saw people who could actually do bad things on Google. So there was somebody that had an expired domain that still had page rank. Okay. And one of my things on safe search said, okay, if, if you have this much page rank, you're probably not going to be pornographic, right? Mm -hmm. Which didn't work for like Playboy or Hustler, but mostly worked and helped a lot with precision and recall. But I saw this one domain that had porn and still got through my filters, and I was like, what happened? And it turned out it was an expired domain that had links from like the W3C. Right. And then I was like, bling, oh, Google can actually be spammed. And at that time, the so conventional you know, wisdom. That's going to be a GIF. <laughs> oh, great. Oh. <laughs> I am going and, and the dinosaur, that's the other one. Um, so. so, yeah, that was my epiphany where like Google can actually be spammed. And at the time, like nobody else including the people at Google, really thought that it could be spammed. And so that was kind of the, the long beginning of working on quality, for me at least. Interesting. And then, so when did Google Guy come about? When you started at Search Quality? Uh, I started in 2001 in like April, and I think Google Guy was like September or October of 2001. Uh -huh. So it only took a few months before I was like, but all of these crazy conspiracy theories are wrong. Yeah. You know, if you've seen that XKCD cartoon, Yeah. Where somebody's like, come to bed. And the guy's like, I can't. And they're like, why not? And he's like, something is wrong on the internet. <laughs> and so there was you, all these people saying, like, oh, if you buy ads, you'll actually get a better ranking. So you went in there. You felt like, I'll use my whatever time. Was it 20% time, or was it really? It was my 20% time, yeah, working on communication. So uh, the PR folks at the time had read Clue Train Manifesto which included, I think, an employee of United Airlines like interacting with people and how that helped. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, hey, while I'm waiting for compiles to finish or safe search to process, do you mind if I hop online and answer questions, debunk misconceptions? And they're like, that seems fine. And that's how it all went from there. And they were cool. They just, whatever you said, and no They were problems. completely cool, yeah. Interesting. So. What, so you felt the need just because you saw a lot of misinformation. That's why you did it? Yeah, it was a lot of misconceptions. And it was interesting because like the story of this is an engineer who eloped to join Google was one that got me in front of a few reporters. Like The PR team was like, hey, this guy's got a few stories to tell. Listen to how he eloped to join Google, which then I think increased their confidence. They were like, oh, he doesn't stick his foot in his mouth more than like two times a day. And some folks might do it 10 times a day. So by the time I wanted to post online, they're like, all right, that seems OK. Yeah, you were pretty, I mean, in terms of community, I've followed and stalked a lot of Googlers over the years. <laughs> um, you were very polished. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes back when there weren't that many people paying attention. So I remember cool. referring to SEO as like watching people juggle chainsaws and like it's entertaining when it goes well <laughs> and really bad when it doesn't go well. But most of that is lost in the mists of webmaster world. So people don't know all the bad you know, things I said. Got to dig that up polish. now again. But, <laughs> um, and you also eventually started commenting under your own name, I guess, because you wanted to like kind of phase out Google Guy. Well, whenever you're commenting on someone else's forum, you have to worry about what happens if that forum gets bought or sold. What if they delete old posts? What if they decide to do whatever? And so it just seemed easier. Everybody was starting a blog. Right. And so I was like, okay, I'll start a blog. That was like 2005. Right. Um, do, I guess what was the why? Why was it necessary for you to work on spam? I know you. I heard videos where you were talking to people, and you're mm -hmm. like, everybody in Google is like, we don't have spam problems. We're unspammable. You can't infiltrate us. Yeah. Was it you? You mentioned earlier in the video that it was you saw things when it came to that domain expiration mm -hmm. uh, with image search and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. When did you? When did the, like these people who said? in Google, we don't need this? When do they say, aha, we actually need this? Was there one example? Well, I, so, two, so from 2001 until 2003, we were working, and there were multiple people there, you know, um, who I won't call up on by name, even though I want to give them credit, because I want to protect their privacy too. But uh, multiple people were thinking about the quality of search at Google. Um, and it sort of kept happening through 2003. And then in 2003, Lots of stuff started to go badly, in my opinion, like as far as search quality and spam. 
Um, what actually kicked off other people caring about a lot was, do you remember when Orkut launched? Yeah. It launched in January 2004. One of many Google social networks. Yeah. Well, okay, but hold on. You got to give credit, right? Like Larry, Sergey, whoever, like they no, they, yeah. they spotted it early. Yeah, it's just sure. they bet on, and Orkut was like bid on a tech stack that wasn't, anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to get into too much. But it was detail. very popular in Brazil, I think. So. It was. Like, it, I think if they, there were a lot of choices made where it could have been even a lot more successful than it was. Anyway. Right. But Orkut launched. This was early 2004. Right. And a bunch of people on Slashdot were like, why is Google launching a social network instead of working on the quality of its search? Yep. And so I think that, that even got up to like, you know, like a a founder of the company who read that on Slashdot and was like, okay, we need to declare code yellow. Like, we actually do have to take spam seriously. And that's, that's from there on, we had good, good um, approval and executive support to kind of make things better. Interesting. And that's happened numerous times over the course of Google, where you had to go through these steps and like, Wall Street Journal wrote something, or major publications wrote like, about the quality of Google, and then yeah. you came out, or Google has come out with, uh, you know, I mean, you got to have algorithm updates over the years. You got to have the mental model right, which is Google wants to do the right thing. It wants to return the best information it can to searchers. You know, if you type in X, you want information about X or answers that solve your your dilemma. Um, and what happens is they also read the news, like they read news.google.com and they read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And so when somebody comes out with some article that says Google does this horrible thing. I mean, Googlers are actually pretty responsive, like about whatever topic it is. Then they try to say, "How can we improve the algorithm, make search better?" Um, that was that was the biggest gut check, that one of the earliest gut checks. But there's been many, many times when somebody will get a story, it percolates, it goes viral. It doesn't have to be in a newspaper; it can be online. It can be in, you know, in your yeah. in your blog, right? And then yeah. people take that data point and they try to make it better. I used to have a link. Search Engine Roundtable used to have a link on the Google blog. That's right. And you got rid of it. I used to as well. You used to too, right? Yeah. Just blog rolls, and nobody does that anymore. Uh, blog rolls. Uh, the good old days. Yeah. Um, to edit this a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> One take. Do it all. Do it all. Do it live. There was a question I wanted to ask you. Um, so, I forgot what was about. To, it was related to this, and I'm now going to have to add, I gotta cut this out. I'll be jacketed. Ja jacketed. <laughs> Abort. Abort. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to it. Um, why? Why was it important for you to? Open up dialogue with the SEO community. <laughs> not just the confusion. It was not. I mean, people were taking advantage of Google, manipulating Google according to the guidelines. Uh, yeah. And you had open dialogue with many people who yeah. were openly out there. Yeah. You know, manipulating. Well, it was. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Like one is, you know, <laughs> what was the saying about. You know, why do people rob banks? Because that's where the money is, right? You know, like when you want to get insights from people about what's going on, hang out on, you know, with SEOs, go to search conferences, talk to black hats, be like, what's the worst thing you've ever done? <laughs> right. Which that plus alcohol can get you some really good answers. And you got lots of good answers. Oh that. my goodness, it was like I'd be drinking Sprite, right? And they would have alcohol, and you'd say, what's the worst thing you've ever done? And it's almost like this confessional where they want to show how smart they are, and they're like, let me tell you what I did. And then you're like, okay, and you write it all down. So Your good, famous little notebook. Yeah, I've still got a, uh, I've still got a notebook. You still like, use it? Yeah, of course. I've, you know, now it's, it's field same. notes. Right. Yeah, awesome. I, I, I continue to iterate and improve. But so getting information was one. You know, it was also a source of goodwill. Um, when people know that they're being heard and valued and respected, then they're more likely to like give you a chance the next time something goes wrong, right? So there were there were a lot of great reasons. I remember going on a walk with you in Vegas yeah. from the conference to some other place. Yeah. And I think that's when you first told me about the search quality raters guidelines and how you're really pushing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you and other people are pushing to kind of make it public. Yeah. And then eventually it did become public. I think. I don't know if you were still at Google when it did. There were a few leaks of it before it became public. Right. But, and, but and at was that point, you're like, why not just have this be available? Yeah. So people can see there's not any crazy conspiracy trying to make yeah. things, whatever. But in hindsight, it was, I mean, I guess there's a, still a lot of confusion around the search quality raters, you know, right. directly impacting, which it yeah, doesn't, yeah, whatever. Exactly. People just still. anybody watching, anything we talk about Google, like, you haven't been at Google for a while. Yeah. So Google has changed a lot. It's all run by machines. Yeah. Everything that's wrong with Google is John Mueller's fault. No, no, no. It's just yeah. Gary's fault. I'm not trying to speak <laughs> on behalf of Google in any way, shape, or form. So, that's not my place. But and we're not going to go through any algorithms and stuff like that. Although I really do want to ask you about Florida. But it's not <laughs> gonna 
Um, but that was one of the major, I think Florida was around 2003 also. So. It was 2003. What do you think about the names of these updates when people at SEO started naming these things? Well, SEOs did and also sometimes Google did, like caffeine. Well, that was an infrastructure update? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> nice try though, nice try. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's fascinating to see what kind of names land, you know, Penguin and Panda. And well, you guys named Panda, I think. Yeah, but it is fascinating. Yeah. It's nice to have a name. Now Danny Sullivan's there and he's like naming them really boring names, Danny. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Web 3.0 dot subsection 27 like, like a no, NOV dot 2019 <laughs> search core ranking update. It's like doing your taxes or flossing. Come like on. how many you need to have Give a cool name. Give us back our cool names. <laughs> Any event, um, was it ever awkward, you know, meeting face to face with these people? I mean, people? usually not, like, right? People, they wanted to talk, they wanted to communicate, they had a story or a complaint or something that they wanted to share, and we wanted to hear that. So I, I loved going to search conferences, honestly, because like you could come back and be like, look at all the insights I got. Everybody's like, do this and do that. Like that was super, super helpful, and it carried a lot of weight within Google, so. So obviously, there's a, remember the cutlets. Uh, yeah. Is that awkward? Like all these people just like swarming you? I think that, that you have to, that was ironic. That was a joke. I don't think that was a real thing to have the cutlets. So. Oh, the name cutlets is a joke. Yeah, yes, yeah. but people did swarm you at conferences. Well, just, I, they would swarm any Google person, right? You know? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, there are people at search conferences, that got, Googlers, that got swarmed. Yeah. yeah. But I remember like PubCons and X and X events is where there would be literally like 50 people plus waiting to talk to you. Well. Because you told but, people secrets and they had unlocked them sure. <laughs> or, or, or tried to interpret things and you know the best way to view things. But it was interesting to do panels and feel like one of the more important things that I could do was like to stick around afterwards and try to answer questions. So I think you know, even if something that doesn't get covered in the main session to be able to like be like, why would this happen? Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of people in the SEO industry really you know felt close to you i mean you kind mm -hmm. of had that personality where people i mean i still it was so whenever i left google i tried very hard to make sure i unfollowed basically everybody who does seo because i was like i got to get some distance from that no yeah. no no you still follow me i don't know if it's by accident yeah but uh <laughs> but for the most part i'm like i, I don't want to talk about you know yeah. you know 302s versus 301s and and that's not my place anymore it's yeah. important to leave it to the people who are doing that um, so I started to follow comedians, but like I absolutely <laughs> do see people tweeting all the time, including people who I don't follow on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I, I'm wondering how they're doing. I'm wondering, yeah, how things are going with them. Yeah, it's a it's a family. You've been part of the industry for what? How long? You 15 plus years? Yeah, in? So yeah it's, it's a family. Yeah. Anyway, did any of your family members make you angry or upset? <laughs> SEO family members. Sometimes, sure. Uh, whenever, for example, if you if you ask somebody, "Are you okay to talk about this off the record?" and then you feel like they uh, blog about it, yes, you know, which happened a couple times. Yes. The vast majority of the time, if you ask, "Look, I'm I'm willing to discuss, you know, what I think might be going on with your site, or or give you some insight, not about your specific site, but why Google might do something one particular way," they'd be like, "Okay, let's just talk." you know, off the record about that. But every so often you'd have one person who's like, I know I said I wouldn't talk about that, but guess what? I just wrote a blog post about it. Boom, here you yeah, go. Yeah, it still happens. It surprises yeah. me that people will be like, all right, let's have an off the record thing. This is obviously on the record, it's on the video. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but one of my policies when I was writing was I won't, even if somebody tells me something behind the scenes mm -hmm. um, and they say it's okay to write about it, I won't write about it unless they publicly Posted on a forum post or Twitter yeah. or social media. Yeah. Cause I want to be crystal clear. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I've lasted so long in blogging. So, <laughs> for now. You also have a thick skin. You got to have thick skin. Yeah. And you must have a thick skin. Uh, you get practice with that. Yeah. I mean, you probably had many death threats. We have, we have lizard skin. Uh, <laughs> there was one. There was one mix up. <laughs> mix up? Yeah. Yeah. There was one mix up where I went to a search conference. And somebody was like, can I talk to you one-on-one? -on -one? And I was like, okay, sure, because that happens a lot. And he, <laughs> we go outside from the search conference, walk a few feet away from everybody else, and he says, where's my money? What? I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I've never met you. And he's like, where's my money? And I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. Okay. He said, look, I gave you, I, I forget how much money it was, $10,000, $25,000 to fix my Google problem, and it didn't get fixed, so I want my money back. Seriously? Yeah, and I'm like, I'm, I have literally, 
I have no idea what you're talking about. And it was, it was a very uncomfortable situation to the point where later my wife made me like start to carry a cell phone around. I hadn't carried a cell phone until that point. This was you know, in the early 2000s. Wow. And, uh, and he got back in touch like a couple days later and he's like, I'm sorry, there was a misunderstanding. I was like, what happened? And he's like, I was working with this dude who said he knew who Matt Cutts was and he could get money to him and so I gave the dude $10,000 to fix my thing and he said he'd give it to Matt Cutts. And it turns out he didn't give it to you. And I'm like, no, why would you think I would take any money? Like, that's not how this works, right? That's not how any of this works. That's but crazy. somebody had scammed that scammer. And he was like, OK, I'll give him you know, this much money. And I can't believe that happened. That's <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a bad situation. Like, we, we were a little worried for a while about whether we needed to get like, security for a few days or whatever. But like, I'm, still, I'm still shocked to this day that you never came to these conferences with somebody no, security. No, 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 no. No, I mean, even that guy, after he realized he had been like bamboozled by a different spammer, like he apologized. He was like, I'm, I'm sorry I threatened to, you know, cause you bodily harm. <laughs> but he didn't hurt you. He didn't, no, 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 no. It was just like a threat. OK. Yeah. I'm sure you had multiple death threats. That yeah. was probably the most serious one that probably freaked That was out. the funniest afterwards. <laughs> I guess in hindsight, it's pretty funny. Um, Nobody ever threatened you, like, if you go to this conference and I see you, you have to watch out, watch your back? Sure, not really. I mean, there's, there'd be I people... I got threats, like, if I'm going to see you at this conference and you better watch your back, I'm going to bring a gun and shoot yeah. you. But I mean... Not that I was worried. I don't think anybody's going to actually do anything. Yeah. It was, Especially at a conference, there's tons of people there. Also, <laughs> it was a little bit of a different time, right? Like, nowadays, I think people were a lot more willing to drop those. Like, you probably get those a little more often. This was, like... 2000, 2010, 2011. Um, I, I've been asked that multiple times. I think it's better now than it was hmm. in the earlier days. And I'm not sure why, but... <laughs> I love that you're like, as a connoisseur of death threats, I no, would like to say but... it's gotten a little better since <laughs> yeah, the bad old days. I think people are just more grown up in the industry. They understand how search works better. Yeah. I think the, maybe that's... For the... sure. In, in the SEO and search industry, for sure. But like online and social media, it feels like people just, you know... Yeah. Do you, have any, a little easier. do you ever have any regrets ever having opening up dialogue with the SEO community? It's no. all no. never. Okay. No. Are you proud of what I kind of you kind of created this quality department? No, I mean they were creating quality. I was like one of eight people okay. in the early days, and 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 sure helped with creating web spam as a team. But in terms of the communication stuff, that was kind of your thing. I mean, you kind of like, I want to do this Google guy thing. I know you don't like, you're a very modest person. Well, and PR was amazing, right? Yes. They, and like, a lot of PR folks are like, the answer is to never reply to someone, right? And Google right. had a much more like clueful, amazing PR team that realized this is a group of stakeholders that are really going to matter. And so it's, it's better to like be forthright, be honest, admit when you make mistakes, and, and try to answer as best as you can. And you can't answer every question. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, send lots super... of I used to send lots of questions. Yeah, you, you did send lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so just to be fair, I used to never send questions and to write my theories. And we're like, that's not how it works. You don't know yeah. what you're talking about. It's better uh, to have the chance to reply and yeah. then choose not to. But, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm super proud of the team. Uh, that worked on web spam and on quality, and uh, and I'm incredibly grateful that they're still there and yeah. st still working hard to make sure that when you type something in, you get a good answer back. Yeah, and even the communication team, the webmaster trend analyst team, yeah. they are doing. I, I think they're doing a tremendous yeah. job. People like John and Gary, and just like the willingness to wade in, to have office hours, to just open themselves up for whatever you know, to engage in specific languages. I. Like, I think it's a pretty much a model of how yeah. a company could do it. That YouTube channel now has well over 300,000 subscribers. Really? Yeah, subscribe. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, was leaving at that time, was it hard? Was it, was it the right time for you or? It was a little hard. I mean, when you've done something for, so I, officially I worked at Google for a month short of 17 years. Um, so it's, it's a little tricky to say goodbye, right? Um, but it, it was the right time and I'm, I'm super, happy to have found amazing colleagues at the US Digital Service. That's where we're at. Yeah. I mean, we're not. The, I no, wish we worked in a joint like this. We work in a very, maybe you'll record a video of it, of our pad later. Yeah, if we're walking back that way, we could yeah. definitely do that. Okay. Um, is there anything uh, you want to share in terms of overall, like looking at back at your career at Google, like with your, mm. some of your bigger achievements? Mm. You know, it's, it's wild because you, 
you just start out and you iterate. So like start out as Google guy and then do a blog and then at some point be like, no, YouTube is a better way to get information out. So I was very happy that like we could record 50 videos in one day, just take a ton of questions, switch shirts every five yes. or six videos, and then just like, boom, you got like four months worth of videos to, to I learned out. that from you because actually <laughs> I did three videos today. <laughs> I tweeted out anybody in DC and people came to the hotel. I'm like, all right, let's do a vlog yeah, yeah. stuff. Did you switch shirts? Have you... I didn't this time, but usually I come prepared and I have shirts okay. and stuff like that. But um, it's, I learned that from you. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, are there any things that you wish the SEO, um, some SEOs really understood that were like maybe missing over these years in general? I mean, the, the one thing I wish. You know, there, there could have been specific times where we're like, it's going to go mobile. The world is going to be mobile. Don't just optimize for desktop. Like we, we were saying that pretty early. But right. to me, that's an illustration of not just make the best site with the best content and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, the hockey metaphor is skate to where the puck is going to be. Right. right. And there's, it is so tempting to react to headlines and updates and whatever. But like, think about the people who cared about responsiveness so it works on your mobile phone or page speed or the user experience way before anybody else. Like they got ahead of a lot of people. And you don't have to rank well on SEO. You can also rank well on user experience and design and you know, coming up with unique angles on things. And so it's, it's just interesting because like, it's hard to come up with that creative angle that makes your site different or sets it apart. But that is the hard, highest ROI work that I think you can do is sit down and think hard about like, okay, why do I want to rank number one as opposed to the 20,000 other sites that are selling, you know, payday loans or mortgage, right. Viagra, whatever. But like, what, what value are you going to add that's unique? And if the more time you put in on that, the better people will do. And that's kind of what you're doing, I guess, on some higher level here at the USDS, where you're kind of looking at what are the big problems that we could solve yeah. that help the most amount of users. Yeah, we actually think about, okay, you know, we want to help the most people in the most need and and, and have the most impact. So it's... Okay, I mean, maybe tell people what the USDS does. Sure, yes. So the US Digital Service is uh, groups of technologists designers, engineers, software engineers, product managers who come in for short tours of duty, anywhere from three to six months to two to four years. And they come and they help make sure that federal computer systems work better for the American people. So think about if you're a veteran trying to access your health benefits, that should work well. Suppose your father has just passed away and you need to figure out how to navigate you know, burial benefits. Um, it could be a farmer who's trying to hire seasonal workers you know, and make sure that that process works well. And what we're most known for is healthcare.gov. So whenever that website fell down in 2013, 2014, and, and trying to make that work better so that you, know, you should not have the signature proposal of a of a administration not work just because the technology doesn't work. So how does that work? You go in and say, whatever contractor worked on that, you know, let us in, let us help you or Yeah, so we're actually in the executive office of the president. About half of us are. Half of us are hired directly into places like Veterans Affairs or the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And so sometimes there's a fire or an emergency and we'll go in and help. But sometimes it's just like come in and tell us, give us an independent view. Like is this a good idea or should we go in a different direction? And it turns out the federal government needs a lot more technical expertise. So, you know, guess how many product managers there are at the average federal agency? The answer is close to zero. Guess how many content strategists there are at most federal agencies? There's, there's some, but they need a lot more. And so, you know, the idea of plain language and user-centered design, or even just moving to the cloud, is still really late to hit. What made you join? What made you decide, hey, I want to try this out and ultimately join? Mainly it was I saw a lot of people that I really respected and liked going to do a tour of duty. So I started in 2016. I signed up for a six-month tour of duty, and that was about three and a half years ago. <laughs> and so they do this thing called commitment escalation that's basically like, hey, come join the U.S. Digital Service. You can stay for like six months. And then people tend to get hooked, and so they'll stay for a little bit longer. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, what are some 
I guess the ways that you worked at Google prepare you for working at the USDS? Is there something like you had this problem at Google and you could ever apply it to something you did at USDS? Well, you know, Google now is about 120,000 employees. Like the yeah. people there that I talked to were like, ah, oh, it's so hard to get things done. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the federal government, so take Veterans Affairs. The Department of Veterans Affairs is about 380,000 employees, which is about the same number of civil servants as the entire government in the UK. Right? So like think about one federal agency as like the equivalent of like an entire large other government. Like how can you best make sure that that works really well? Well, working in large organizations, trying to figure out how to build consensus, all those kinds of things really help. Are there any parallels between Google and the USDS? I mean, absolutely. Uh, what has struck, struck me a lot more is, is there are some differences. So. Um, at Google, once you get approval from you know the product team and security, engineering, PR, internationalization, like you're good to launch, right? You know you can flip the switch, you can press the big red button that deploys the new index or whatever. Right. Um, and in government, at least the federal government, once you finish the system, you still have to get an authority to operate, which is an approval to turn the system on. Okay. And so think of like 400 controls that you have to say, okay. Do you require the users to change their password every 60 days? You know, this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and that makes government move a little bit slower. Um, also, sometimes private industry is a little more willing to take risk. Right. Government can't always do that, sometimes for very good reasons, because government has to serve everybody. We can't just cherry pick who we want to serve. Um, but at the same time, like, it, you know, if you can move more waterfall projects toward agile projects, you'd end up with some better results for the American public. Cool. And there's a lot of people watching here in the SEO and SEM industry. Mm. Um, how could they? How do you think they could like? Let's say they're happy with what they're doing, but yet they're looking for something more meaningful. Yeah. How how can they help the USDS? So we absolutely need people who can get things done in large organizations. Uh, Things like content strategists, for example, are extremely useful. So last year for Veterans Day, the Department of Veterans Affairs rolled out VA.gov, which is a brand new website that basically lets you message your doctor, fill prescriptions, change your address in one spot, and, and that percolates through dozens of VA systems. So it's like a much better user experience. A lot of government agencies have websites like Brochureware, where it tells you about the agency, but you can't actually do anything. Right. And so VA uh, did a fantastic job of launching that. The US Digital Service was delighted to help a little bit around, around supporting that. And having people who can speak for users, having people who can employ user-centered design, do user research, think about content strategy, think about plain language, like you want to communicate clearly, right. you know, that's a useful skill uh, in the SEO space. And I remember going to search conferences and being like, hey, uh, whether you want to call this particular person hyper intelligent or not, they are definitely shrewd. Like SEOs are very good at getting results, right? Right, uh, and being able to get good things done in a large organization, like it really matters. Um, so I've had people in the search space reach out and say, like, "Hey, I was signing up for something for my dad, and uh, and." The website worked better, and was that y'all? And it, and it was us. We'd helped in some capacity with something. So if you're looking for something with a little meaning and purpose, we have that in spades at the US Digital Service. And they go to, how do they apply? USDS.gov, specifically USDS.gov slash apply. And awesome. we'd love to have people. What's the page rank of the, site, of the URL? <laughs> well, we're at .gov, so <laughs> we've got a lot of page rank. Awesome. <laughs> Matt, I deeply appreciate you know, oh. doing the video. I deeply appreciate every you've done, everything you've done for Google, for the SEO community, for the community at wide, of course, even the US, the United States. I mean, it's amazing what you've done in your career. Um, you've been so instrumental in everything. And uh, even my daily life, it's just, it's, you're a good person. People okay. look up to you, people respect you. Mm. And I think you deeply care about everybody, so I appreciate that. And from the SEO community mm. to you, thank you everything that you've done, I appreciate Man, it. Man, I just, thank you so much. It's good <laughs> to see you again. Oh, it's amazing to see you. We should do it again <laughs> more often. Thank yeah, you Yeah, yeah, every two years, boom. Bye, thanks. <laughs> so that's Matt Cutts. It's been a long time since I've seen him. Still an amazing guy. I do miss him terribly, at least being specifically in the Google-verse, in the SEO community, I think it's, He's, I just miss him. I miss him a lot and it was great catching up with him. So you know, his office, which I just showed you a little bit before, is 
right behind me over there and those buildings right over there and the white house trying to get you a good view of it is right where i'm looking right now with my eyes i'm gonna walk a little bit further so right over there it's a lot of things boarded up they're working on like this new projects around it but well, if you can see it's right behind me right now over there is the white house so he's literally like a few minute walk from the white house any event appreciate matt and his team giving me the time to talk to him and i hope you enjoy the interview don't forget if you're looking for something pretty meaningful to do you're towards maybe he made enough money in the seo industry by spamming and jamming and you're looking for something new to do it's really really do a really amazing stuff that affects millions and millions of americans anyway back to new york i'll keep you posted along the way bye all right so i'm on my way back to new york it's gonna be about four and a half hours currently with traffic which it's long, but I guess expected based on me going to be driving into rush hour everywhere. Hopefully the weather will hold up and hopefully it won't be too uh, wet and rainy on the way home. Hope you enjoy the vlog. If you like it, make sure to hit that subscribe button, the bell, comment below, and I hope you, like me, enjoy that conversation I had with Matt Kotz because I really do admire the guy. Speak to you soon.